All right, good afternoon. Um, thanks for the introduction. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for putting together such an awesome uh, meeting. I've learned a lot since this morning already. Um, today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is coding decoding the Cosmos uh, applications um, in astrophysics. Uh, basically, I'm going to tell you about uh, what we use in a um, a day-to-day -day life in, in studying astrophysics in general. Um, my name is Chiwei Chang. I'm currently a postdoc at ETH Zurich in the cosmology group. And um, as I advertise in the, the abstract, um, I'm going to focus, or the main part of my talk is going to be on two explicit examples in science analyses. Um, first one is mapping dark matter using galaxy shapes. And the second one is um, flying drones and calibrating radio telescopes. So we have two drones in a row. So uh, there's a lot of jargon I just threw out. Don't worry, you'll understand it at the end of this talk. Um, and uh, you might think drones and dark matter, this is like two random things and it may or may not be related to Python at all. Uh, but in a way, I think this is like telling the community that Python is really everywhere today in science and also um, how we use it uh, to explore very different areas in science. And that's why um, Python is such a great tool for, uh, for astronomy in general. OK, so just to put it out there, I'm a physics by training. Um, my coding skills is probably close to you guys when you were all 13 or younger. <laughs> so um, this talk is not about coding. It's not about learning fancy new toting techniques, you'll probably not learn anything um, from that respect. But what you will learn is um, how accessible Python is to us normal um, scientists and how we can do a lot of cool science just using relatively simple Python. Another way to look at it with all you guys developing very cool tools, you can see how these things are being applied to um, a lot of science and also if at any point you like to work on astronomy, there's always a, a place in the field that you can join. OK, so astrophysics. Um, in order to understand the things that we care about, it's good to put us in respect to um, these objects we study. So just, just running down, we are here at Fahoshule, Rapisville, in the beautiful uh, Zurich, next to the beautiful Zurich Lake, um, which is somewhere in Switzerland. Switzerland is somewhere in Europe, which is somewhere in our globe, which is the planet Earth. It fits nicely into the solar system. This is where astronomy starts, um, together with seven or eight, depending on who you ask, planets um, in the solar system, surrounding our favorite star, which is the sun. The sun is one star, right? Um, in this galaxy, which is the Milky Way we all live in, there is 300 billion stars. Um, similar to our sun. And a galaxy is actually just a very small unit in the world of cosmology. It fits into one dot in this map of galaxies, which is a pretty old galaxy uh, experiment or survey that I'll talk about later. And if we zoom out even more, actually, galaxies never exist forever. Um, before that, uh, stars had to form. Before that, uh, hydrogen clouds had to form, before that hydrogen had to form, and before that nuclei had to form. So in the entire cosmic history, uh, there's a lot of things that happen, and only very, very recently, uh, galaxies form, life form, and we exist. Uh, and that is the field of cosmology. We study the history, the evolution of the universe, um, and um, how the observations today fit into this big picture. So in a way, we as cosmologists are generally very humble because we know how small we are and compared to the vast cosmos. Um, and this is uh, the, the field we're going to talk about today. So coming back to computing, um, just to warn you, scientific computing or just general um, computing in science in our field is rather different from that in industry. Uh, this is somewhat similar to what uh, our former, uh, the previous speaker talked about. We want quick, sometimes dirty, um, analyses and results right away. We want to see them, and we want to iteratively refine our parameters to see what it looks like. We like to plot things. We like to share around with everybody. Um, 
And Python is such a, a, a very easy to learn and interactive tool that we can do such things. Um, that comes along with uh, a statement of is less rigorous testing and control. Maybe later on in the stage when our idea has formalized, uh, you start to write unit tests and do other things. But in the very beginning, we're not going to sit down and start laying architecture and designing unit tests in the very beginning. Um, there is very different requirements in industry versus academics. Uh, sometimes it's orders of magnitude, and that's fine. Like plus minus 100 is fine. Uh, sometimes we require ridiculous accuracy, 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 8 or whatever. Um, and those times uh, come where uh, in industry you really just need the product to be made, whereas here we are validating some theory that requires uh, a precision to so much. And um, that's another point. Um, the, last, the last point is, uh, basically, it's, I like to do the analogy of it's like doing an experiment. Um, we start with something very new, a idea, or, or something just generally uh, from the data. We want to explore data and find out new things. So we never know how this is going to turn out. And um, targets or deadlines are generally just uh, for reference. And uh, they move around all the time. OK. So here are some um, recent uh, languages that uh, I know about that's used in um, the Astro community. When I say recent, that means as long as I was in the field, which is about almost 10 years, maybe. Um, so that's the standard C, C++, Fortran. Uh, Perl was once used. Uh, general shell scripts, Mathematica, MATLAB is good for um, more analytic uh, jobs. Root is a particle physics specific um, software that's not that much used in astronomy yet sometimes. The main players these days um, is basically IDL and Python, um, with generally more shifting from IDL to Python because of the openness, because of the freeness, because of the, the community support, and of course because it's free. Um, there's a lot of libraries in Astro that's surrounding these things and wrappers to other um, kind of softwares that are in Python, and that also makes it um, why this is the favorite language in the community. Um, inside Python, these are the standard packages that we use in day-to-day -day life. So SumPy, NumPy, Matplotlib, these are scientific uh, and plotting um, routines and functions. SymPy is a symbolic representation of mathematic um, software. Uh, Pandas deals with tables, databases, large data sets. Uh, Scikit-learn is a machine learning um, package. AstroPy is just a general package that packs together a lot of um, astronomy, astronomy functions that normal people won't really care. Um, so IPython and Jupyter, as already introduced earlier, and also we have a talk today on this as well, is heavily used in the recent like one or two years, mostly because it's interactive, it's great for teaching, it's great for sharing, and um, it's great for plotting as well. OK, since we're here, I thought it's appropriate to do some advertisement. Um, these are the packages that are developed in our code. In fact, the main developers are are already in the crowd. Uh, one is actually our moderator, Jill Accurate, and uh, Sebastian Sejas, a PhD student, as well as Lucas Gamper, another software engineer. Um, these are the first three are on GitHub, and you can fork away if you want. Um, the last one is, is on this website. Uh, the first hope is a Python just in time compiler. Second one allows you to do um, massive parallel MCMC calculations on clusters. The third one, is a parallelized uh, approximate Bayesian computation package. And the last one deals with um, direct imaging of exoplanets. OK, so we go on to our two examples. Um, you can find the, the scientific reference here. I will point out the more public media reference later. Um, but if you're really interested in the analysis, you can go to these two. Um, the first is on mapping dark matter. The second is about drones. No, it's about cali calibrating radio telescopes. OK, so dark matter. Earlier, I told you about how small we are compared to the cosmos. Now I'm going to tell you about how little we know compared to everything that we have in the universe. Um, so 
it appears that if we add up all the stars, the galaxies, everything we can see, the 5,000 years of human history, everything added together, it's not enough mass to explain things we observe, like uh, stars rotating around galaxies or distribution of galaxies in, in general. Um, there needs to be about five times more matter or mass in the universe that we just cannot see. They don't interact with light, they're just dark. So um, very creatively, we call them dark matter. Um, and that's like five, five, five times more than ordinary matter. There's another 70% that I'm not going to talk about today, but basically they're responsible for the accelerative expansion of the universe, which you might have heard. Um, I apologize for the slightly dramatic naming taste in cosmology, but that's what it's called. <laughs> okay, so we cannot really see least dark matter, but there are ways to get around it. We can see it through gravity, because they interact through gravity, that's why we know they have mass. Um, this particular way we look at them is called gravitational lensing. The concept is very similar to an optical lens, where basically if you have a lens, light goes through, it gets bent. Um, in the same way, in Einstein's general relativity, uh, he predicted that light passing through a very massive object, it will be bent because of the curvature of space-time. So this is particularly what I'm explaining here. Um, in reality, what we measure is the distortion of galaxy shapes uh, that tell you about the distribution of dark matter. And with a lot of them, we can map out, basically, dark matter. Um, so, the name of the game is basically measuring galaxy shapes. That can't be too hard, right? Uh, it appears that it is hard, and it appears that it's a computational challenge more than anything. It's not really a, a, a theory challenge or a physics challenge. It's just measuring the shape of a thing. Um, the reason being, they are usually smudges like this, very noisy, uh, very faint, with a lot of instrument effects that we need to correct for, and we need to measure a lot of them. So this has been known to be a computational challenge, and the, the lensing community, that's what we call ourselves, has been seeking out to uh, the statistics and computation uh, community for help. Uh, both Kaggle and Pascal, you might have heard of, is machine learning and statistics um, challenges, public challenges. And these have both hosted uh, lensing challenges. Um, we also have our own challenge. This is this. Uh, the most recent one is called GREAT3. It stands for the Third Gravitational Lensing Accuracy Testing Challenge. And um, it just recently finished. Uh, the whole code is actually hosted on GitHub, and it's mostly in Python as well. So um, basically, this is what we do. We measure galaxy shapes, and we try to figure out what it means. Um, the particular analysis I'm going to talk about today comes from this telescope and this survey. Um, it's called the Dark Energy Survey or DES, as I will talk about later. Um, when we talk about survey in astronomy, what we really mean is we want to take pictures of the sky in a very large area, not on a particular object. It's just generally surveying the sky um, as much as you can go. Um, so this is the telescope we use. It's called Blanco. It's in Chile. It's a four meter class telescope. Um, this is the beautiful camera that sits on the telescope. It's now um, currently the largest digital camera on Earth. It's 570 megapixel. In comparison, the, um, the iPhone camera you have in your pocket is about 8 megapixel. Um, so that's, that's the focal plane. And uh, it's going to cover, in the end, 5,000 square degrees, just so you have an idea of what 5,000 square degrees looks like. If you cut open a sphere and put it on 2D plane, that uh, purple area is 5,000 square degrees. Um, another way to think of it is in the Earth, it's Eurasia plus Australia. That's about the area um, that we're talking about. OK, so we take pictures of the sky, right? Um, and the pictures generally look like that, not very impressive. This is only a very, very small patch of an image um, of the whole footprint. Uh, we do some calibration, some cleaning. The main task is actually identifying these objects, extracting the objects, and then measuring them, measuring their flux, measuring their size, and most importantly for us, measuring the shape of them. Um, after we do that, uh, we would 
condense this information in something what we call the catalog, which is basically a list of stuff with objects and characteristics, and then scientists can work from that. Um, right. Okay, so we did that. And then the next thing is to take the shapes and turn it into a map, right? Just so you, so you know that I'm not just plotting pretty pictures, I did put an equation here. But I was warned that I should not put too many equations. Uh, <laughs> but I do do math. Okay, so this is what the, the actual conversion looks like. Uh, galaxy shapes is represented by the gamma. It turns into mass, which is represent the kappa. Um, basically, it involves a pixelization, a Fourier transform, some multiplications in Fourier space, and an inverse Fourier transform. And that gives you this map. Okay, so what you're looking at here is um, the projected mass. Dark matter mostly, because we said it's total mass, but there's five times more dark matter. Um, in an area of about 150, uh, 150 square degrees. So it's much smaller than what I showed earlier. Earlier it was like uh, 5,000 square degrees. Here's a moon on the sky, just for reference. So that's that big. You can, you can think, image that in the sky. It's actually not that big. Once we cover the entire area, it would uh, be significant. Um, the redder areas indicate more mass, the bluer area indicates less map. And this, this map has been smoothed so that you actually see structure uh, other than noise. Um, another way to convince ourselves we're actually seeing dark matter and not just seeing noise is we can overlay stuff that we actually see and we know light generally does trace light to some, ex uh, sorry, light generally does trace mass to some extent. So here, each circle represents a galaxy clusters. Uh, a galaxy cluster is just a bunch of galaxies bound together. Um, there are the most massive bound structure that we know in the universe. So it's a, it's a fair representation of mass. And if you squint your eyes at this plot, you will see that indeed the circles tend to follow the red regions and avoid the blue regions. Um, of course, it's not perfect because this is a measurement and there's noise, um, but uh, it is showing that we don't do know how to do lensing and um, we're getting reasonable results. Um, just so that I'm not totally off topic, I put here some Python packages I used in this analysis. <laughs> <laughs> just so that you have a sense of what we do in astronomy, mainly it's circulating around SciPy, NumPy, and, and AstroPy sometimes. Uh, but uh, for you, this is probably very common um, packages or common functionalities, but, but that's really all, uh, like a lot of science is basically based on these. Okay, I'm gonna summarize this part. Uh, so I hope I convince you that uh, we can do weak lensing and it's pretty cool because we can use weak lensing to uh, map out dark matter distributions. Um, this is, appears to be a, a computational challenge and we have historically appealed to the computation community uh, for help. Um, and we use the data from Dark Energy Survey to make maps, and this actually appeared on a few public media, uh, Spiegel and BBC, which I have links here if you're interested in reading it. The first one is in German, you don't really read it. Okay, um, now switching gears, I'd like to talk about a very different project. Um, this is on calibrating radio telescopes. Um, so, in the, among the very diverse projects that happened in our group, one of them uses um, this radio telescope that actually is owned by our group. It is about an hour outside Zurich, it's not that far, in this beautiful like dairy farm. Um, the farmer lives actually just in that house. I'm out of light, yeah, that house. Um, uh, there's two telescopes in this observatory. This is the seven meter. There is another five meter sitting somewhere over here. And um, that's, that's basically our telescope, we call it Blyan. Um, so, before we do science, a very important thing in general is to understand your instrument. And particularly in this case, um, this telescope is pretty old. We haven't carefully calibrated it for a while. So we want to calibrate it. So when I say calibrate, Really what I mean is to understand the instrument response um, in, 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 like, in the space. The instrument response uh, from the input signal, how does the recording respond 
when uh, the signal comes from different angles on the sky. OK, so that's, that's our, our, uh, our target. And normally, what people do is they look at bright things in the sky, like the sun, the moon, some supernova remnant, or other things. Um, but that has the, the disadvantage of you are limited by the flux of the object, um, what time it is on the sky, and where it is on the sky. So in one of these random coffee sessions, like this crazy idea came up. Why don't we just fly our own source, right? How hard can that be? We just put a source on a drone, fly on top of the radio telescope, and map out the beam. It sounds very sensible, right? Um, so that's what we did. Uh, so here's a schematic of what the experiment looks like. Uh, this is our radio telescope. Um, the drone will be flying on this plane 150 meters above ground. 150 meters, by the way, if you're ever interested, is the maximum height a drone can fly in Switzerland without getting a permit. <laughs> OK? OK. So that's where we fly. And it, it accidentally has also been being the far field limit for our telescope. That's just an accident. OK, so we're going to fly in this gritty pattern so that we can at, map out in, in high resolution what the, the beam or the response look like in these different points on the sky. Um, this is, of course, the main rule or the main character in this experiment, the drone. It's a hexacopter. Uh, um, uh, it's from this local company called Copter Shop, if anybody knows of it. Um, it's carrying this transmitter, which is going to emit signal, like pulses signals, uh, where we're going to record in the telescope. Uh, we even bothered to print a ETH signal on it. And the maximum um, weight for the load is 2 kilograms, while the entire thing is about 11 kilograms. OK, so what's the computational challenge in this one? It's a very different one. Um, it's not too much like fancy coding or, or, or difficult package or very hard math. It's really just interfacing between these different things that are not designed to be interfaced together, because this is an entirely new thing that people never thought of doing. Um, so this, this includes the copter shop people, includes our radio engineer, and includes these, these scientists that don't really know much. So um, communicating and sharing the ideas and, and making plots and just exploring the data on the spot is, is a very important thing in this particular experiment. Um, and for that, IPython Notebook is just perfect. So we can, we, can, we can make a plot, we can show it to our engineers, or show it to cop shop people, and then they can on the spot make comments, uh, try this or that, whatever. Um, so this is one of the projects you actually feel like it's doing an experiment, because it's new and you never know what it's going to turn out. OK, so um, this is what the data looks like. And I'm just going to walk through the, the processing. Uh, this is raw data. So remember, we're, um, OK, so <laughs> let me explain a little more. This is the raw data of the drone flying from far away to just right on top of the beam and then far away again. OK, so right on top of the telescope, it should have maximum signal, and away it should have low signal. These wiggly things is basically like a diffraction pattern where you're supposed to see wiggly things. Um, because the, the transmitter was pulsing on and off, we have these jaggedy uh, on-off signals. And also, because there's imperfection in the transmitter, um, there is this um, spike at the end of the off signal. OK, so the question is really just linking this to the data on the drone. Uh, so we want to know where was the drone when we received signal x. And then to clean all this crap, interpolate it, um, this uh, low red line is actually the emission from the drone itself and not the transmitter. So we need to uh, subtract that in order to get our final signal. OK, so that's all done in Python. Everything is very well controlled. Um, so we do this for all the tracks in both directions. And then we can make a map. Uh, so this is uh, one of these maps. I say it's 3D because it's 2D, and then this, the third dimension is in frequency. Um, and so just a simple interpolation, and you can see the, the, when the drone was right on top of the telescope, it's have maximum signal. Um, if you squint your eyes, you can see a ring-like structure going out. That's a diffraction pattern. 
And you also see a um, diagonal uh, feature, and that comes from the polarization of the telescope. Um, but basically, that's, that's our result, and we're very happy with it. It's, it's fairly consistent with other methods we measure, but it's, it's relatively flexible because we can fly a drone anytime we want, basically. Um, and, and yeah, I'm just listing other packages here. Um, you've noticed that the, the, the plotting has became better in, in this set of analysis because we start using Seaborn. Um, yeah. So to summarize this part, uh, as I said, uh, this experiment has the, the characteristic of there's a lot of interfacing and communication, and it's also a very new thing that does not have a set um, thing, set like ritual we need to follow. So it's a lot about exploring, a lot about testing and changing things. Um, I Type Final Notebook has been a, a, a very good tool in this regard. And of course, drones are very cool. Um, <laughs> OK, so you can also read about a more general description of this piece of work on this blog post called Astrobytes. OK, so basically, that's the two experiment. And uh, this is my summary slide. Um, so today I've told you about the general culture in, in, in a typical astronomer's daily life, uh, using Python in the day-to-day -day life of analyzing data. Um, I walk through the two examples I'm showing here, and I'd just like to end with, there is a lot of stuff between us and the vast cosmos. Most of them can be solved with Python. Um, before I end. <laughs> so I, uh, I just like to thank the, the very cool people I work with. Um, aside from the entire cosmology group, uh, there's also a DES collaboration. Um, just so that if you want to chat with anybody during the coffee break, I like to point out a few people. Uh, so Lucas Gamper and Joe Ackeret, I already pointed out, they're two software um, consultant. We're, we're basically software uh, scientists in our group that support most of our needs in software development and questions. Uh, on the bottom, uh, aside from me, there's three other PhD students. Um, Sebastian Se has and, and Gina Nicola and Simon Se Bear. <laughs> there are three PhD students. And anyway, they're all very cool. You should all talk to them. Um, right. OK, so I'm going to end here. However, uh, I can take questions. and. Or we can watch a movie first. <laughs> <laughs> this is only last for four minutes. We still have time for questions afterwards. How about that? Let's do that. OK, so this is, this is really nothing to do with Python. This is just really. <laughs> <laughs> is it coming through?
All right. That's it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, is there a simple experiment I can do, do at home <laughs> with Python and cosmology? So, and cosmology. do you have an idea? Said at home, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can download uh, like public data. Like there's this Sloan Digital. There's a lot of these these surveys that are slightly older, but they're public, and their interface is usually pretty good. So. Um, you can play with the images. You can try to come up with the excellent way to measure galaxy shapes, and then you tell us, <laughs> and then we're all good. <laughs> so it's not directly cosmology, but one of the package that GUA mentioned is, is Pinpoint. It comes with a set of data in the package, and you can actually process the data and look at the next planet then. Uh, when you were learning Python and when you're using Python on your day-to-day -day basis and uh, packages that you use, uh, which resources or communities do you think are most uh, useful to you or most important to you to uh, work with, with Python and the, the packages? Um, I mean, I would say, of course, Googling is, 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 is very useful, right? Like uh, the Stack Overflow and, and all these just general Python documentation. And it does help that um, Jill is in our group and there's other software support that's in our group. Um, but I think one thing that makes Python attractive is the, the community. Like, it's very easy to Google solutions and people just talk to each other so much that it's really not that hard. And that, like, to be honest, the problems that we usually encounter are not that hard. So um, it's, it's, it's easy to get answers just by going online if it's slightly harder then yeah, I would just go to some of the more Python, um, Pythonic people and ask them. Other questions? One here in the front. I have a question too, uh, here. Yeah. Uh, if you use the drone to calibrate the telescope, how did you calibrate the drone so that you know that the pattern should fly is actually being flown? So we have the GPS recording. So there's an inaccuracy on the positioning of the drone, but that's the inaccuracy of, of the GPS, basically. And we, like, that, you can only improve that by using a better uh, location uh, system. That's like these, these uh, portable actual other GPS systems that has like three points or whatever. Um, but for now, we have that and we quote an accuracy on it. That's usually how it goes. But yeah, that's that's our uh, our understanding of how well the drone is on the sky is according to how well we know the GPS system. Another question here. I have the same question. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just as a follow up, I was wondering, are you using just GPS or did you use GLONASS and uh, Beidou no. navigation system? Okay. So this was the first try. We just used the GPS, and there was actually um, like a day that we couldn't do it because. Like, there was only two GPSs on the sky. We need to wait when there's three. Yeah, so, yeah. So there's some of the things that just happen during the experiment. Um, once you calibrate uh, the telescope... Why is everybody so interested about a drone? <laughs> 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 All right, go ahead. Because drones are cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once you calibrate this telescope, do you need to do it again? or you get this map and that's all you need forever? So uh, normally radio telescopes are quite robust. They don't change that much. Uh, to do, so this is more of a proof of principle. We can do this. If you really want to use this as a regular calibration for your telescope, you would want to do it maybe once every few months, and you want to do it at different positions, because it might depend on where, where your telescope is in elevation. But in general, radio telescopes are, are pretty robust. They're not like optical. They don't change that much. Hi. Um, it's mostly more a comment, not a question, really. It's just to say that after astrophysics started using Python for mostly everything, 
which is great. Um, high energy physics also moved towards Python and now it's used more or less everywhere. In every analysis I know of, yeah. Python is in, in, used and all the tools you mentioned, yeah. not Astro PY of course because it's really specific, but all yeah. the rest is very highly used in high energy physics. Yeah. And I understand that also in biology they start using it now more and more yeah. because of the user friendliness. It's very, very easy to start coding your, your analysis system. Right. Um, Usually you use C++. Traditionally, C++ is the language of choice, right. but it's painful. And when you're a student, <laughs> when you're a student, you have to learn about uh, those weird type errors and, <laughs> and unexpected things and const and whatever. And you arrive in the world of Python where you basically code your analysis in two lines of Python and you're, wow, this is amazing, it actually works. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a comment, but it's just to say that research now gets more interested about what the, the physics is about, or the science is about, more than about the language, which it used to be. Yeah, so it's a exactly. change of paradigm, and it's actually very good for the, for the science. Mm, yeah, I, I totally agree. All right, so we're running into the break, so let's thank Chiwe again.